Good morning. Welcome. And it's Wednesday. There's a little bit of background noise here today, so uh, you'll just have to maybe um, <laughs> plug your ears for that if you can. And uh, we're going to jump right into this project, which is a, um, a glass swan. So let's just get into it right away. And I'm going to start with the drawing. But I'm going to be working on Arches 140 pound cold press paper. And I'm going to be using mainly a palette of Da Vinci watercolors. Uh, I do have some Winsor Newton in here and, and uh, some Core and some other colors in there, but most of it is uh, Da Vinci. Uh, so I've printed out this image here. This is just a little glass dish um, with, a, with a swan neck. But I really liked how the um, colors play and and flip around in in this this is actually a reflection of this which is very weird because it's at the top so a uh, glass will actually work a lot like a water drop where it sort of inverts uh, colors and things like that so there's some interesting pattern that's going on here and everything but let's start off with a drawing um, normally I stretch my watercolor paper but I didn't have a piece already prepared so we're just gonna work on um, on regular unstretched paper. So um, I'm, not, I'm not going to be using a great big wash or anything like that in the background, so it's not going to be a problem for me. But let's start with the drawing here, and, and we've got the dish here which is shaped like a teardrop. So um, I'm going to begin with that, and one thing you might not know about painting a um, an oval or a circle or something like that is that it is sometimes easier to kind of make like an octagon or a hexagon or something like that and then round off the corners and it's a really weird phenomenon but what happens is our brain can manage um, straight lines a little easier than it can um, accurately portray um, circles and ovals. So if I start off with sort of a a uh, hexagon shape like that, and I think I need to zoom in on this because it's a little too light, a little too hard to see, I will draw this a little darker than I normally would. When you're drawing you should be starting off with a light touch um, because if, if you press hard you're kind of locking in those lines and then then you're kind of committed to that um, that line once you've done that. So you can see that what I'm doing here is kind of, I'm kind of working out straight lines and now I can carve those into the shape that I want. And yeah, it's, it's kind of a weird thing but when I do this I end up with something a little more accurate. Strange as it may seem. So if you've often struggled with getting say the the proper shape for an egg or a marble or you know, anything like that, uh, give this a go. Uh, <laughs> a, a glass kiwi paperweight, that should be fun. So uh, yeah, they actually make so many interesting glass things now. Uh, oh, even old things were very interesting when you have um, glass and how they can form it into different shapes. Coming down here with the neck, so you, hopefully you can see that drawing. Hopefully it's not uh, too covered up. Now the neck extends out. Let's see, it extends out more here. And as I said, I would normally do this drawing a lot lighter, uh, but you guys need to see it. So, so here we go. Right, so we do that kind of a shape and then like... got this big cheek here and so I wanted to go through the drawing process on this one because uh, because there's so many curves and things and and how I managed to um, approach that type of thing might be useful for you as well um, I find that actually helps sometimes uh, when I'm doing something in perspective even to 
to do that. Okay, I don't, okay, so here's, here's what I'm looking at, all right? So what I'm looking at is where this line is here, going straight up, and where this beak is. On my drawing, the beak is back a little bit more than that, I think. So I think I have my head a little bit too far forward. So I'm going to do a little correction here before I start putting uh, brush to uh, paper here. If I don't do the correction now, I'm not going to be able to correct that with paint. So let's try this one more time here, come back a little bit further. I think my neck is too big and that's the trouble because when I'm looking at this, I don't want my head to come back as far as my tail, right? So I think this might even have to come back here a little bit more. So I'm doing my corrections with my drawing before I start locking in my paint. But I don't want to invest a whole lot of time with this because of the time restrictions we have. Um, actually, we don't have that much of a restriction, but today I do have a restriction because I have to be somewhere. <laughs> um, but, all right, so we have that that comes over. So that just isn't a perfect loop there. It's almost like a, it's almost like a little corner right, right in this area here. So I'm going to make that a corner. something like this and that seems to be a little bit better I have more space so you can see the dotted line I lined up with the the front of the neck here and that spacing seems to be a lot better so I'll erase this let's erase the working lines so I don't want to see this line coming through here and then I would start to fine-tune and we'll get into that um, so now I can start to round my shapes now that I have the general uh, shape in there and I'm going to also start um, creating some of the these these lines here that are sort of on the glass and the different shapes that will separate the colors and so on so And this comes up to approximately there. I've got the round shape here. And once I have all my, my lines sort of where I think that they are representing the shape properly, that's when I'll come in and I'll start to uh, take away on any of the unnecessary lines, which normally I would do a lot lighter, but this has to come up a little higher, I see. Right, so I'm getting this locked in. You can see all these all these duplicate lines here that I've got on here. I want to want to make sure I'm getting rid of those. Lots of times I will do this kind of drawing. I'll do this on a separate thing like a um, piece of tracing paper or a regular piece of paper and then I will transfer it with graphite paper or something like that. And um, by doing that uh, I, I just have a clean line on my on my watercolor paper and there's no sort of abrasive rate erasing or anything like that so that's often what I do but I know many of you will work directly on your 
watercolor paper as I'm doing right now. Especially if you're, say, out, outside paint, painting from life or something like that. Um, this is the time of year. It's uh, August 2nd here in southern Ontario and it's it's great time of year to do plein air painting if you're if that's something that you've ever tried I would I do recommend it getting outdoors and painting um, <laughs> you will quickly learn as a plein air painter that uh, one of the things you have to do is uh, uh, not take so much stuff <laughs> I have taught uh, several plein air painting courses and uh, the one thing that almost every new artist will do at, when they're starting to do plein air painting is they will take a boatload <laughs> of uh, materials with them and really you only need the basics. Um, in fact even in my studio I find that I've, if I have just the basics that's really all I need. I find most of the time I'm sort of reverting to um, basics even in my studio. All right so now we have um, this believe it or not is not part of the glass this is the reflection on the table and it just goes to show you the power of light passing through glass and what it can do and how it can illuminate uh, what would normally be a shadow. If this was a solid object that would be a shadow there but because this is glass look at that beautiful um, shadow in, in that and if you know any of my work uh, which you can see on Instagram or Facebook or any of those places um, if you've seen any of my work then you know that um, I do a lot of glass and one of the most interesting things I find about painting glass are the reflections because these reflections are so luminous um, I, I love that part of it so I'm going to come in and just do a little bit more drawing here but I want to I want to create the interior of this glass as well. So I've got kind of a light line that comes here. So I'm going to indicate where that is. And it comes up and then it comes almost to this uh, sort of tail end here. Bring it in there like that. And for the uh, for the folks that really just struggle a lot with the with the drawing and you just want to have a nice painting, well, there's always the option of um, taking something like this and actually you know tracing it on there, and you could do that too. Uh, but I love to draw, and I think it's part of the uh, part of the process. If you if you learn to draw then you've already got a kind of a rehearsal in before you start the painting process. So you understand your painting or what you're going to paint even better when you have drawn it and analyzed it. Because although I'm actually just creating a line drawing, what I'm really doing is I'm, I'm really observing the um, everything in my picture here. I think I need to move my image over like that. that. That would help a lot. I had that there. Um, okay, so these lines I am doing lighter because I really don't want to have uh, lines in my finished painting. They will show through in watercolor as you know. So there's kind of a dark line here. Ooh, what a funny, funny shape this is. Not going to question it. I'm just going to draw what I'm seeing because I don't want to create some sort of weird new reality. I just want to create the look of this glass, which is very nice on its own. All right, so we'll get into the drawing. Let's erase some of these other lines. And now for the reflection and I really will have to do this reflection very lightly. Um, I know sometimes when I'm teaching a workshop and I don't put lines in for certain things uh, it, it may be frustrating for the students you know maybe your drawing skills aren't that strong and everything but one thing 
that uh, would happen if I did really strong lines, these would most certainly show. I would have these really strong pencil lines, you know, so it would look like I have this outline on this, but it's, it needs to have these softer edges. So I have to be extremely light when I'm doing my drawing for certain things. Some things on my drawing I will do dark, some things I will do light, like the interior of this. I know that um, anything light, especially yellow, is going to really show through. Uh, the pencil lines will show through. So. Let's come down very lightly. All the time I'm drawing, you know what I'm looking at? I'm looking at the relationship of where this, this triangle, for example, where this triangle lines up here, and it's just about where this is. So if I'm going to do this line, I know that it's got to be right directly below this. And I'm always doing this comparison as I'm working in watercolor or in, when never mind watercolor I mean just drawing in general um, now I do think that this this has to be a bit lower maybe but uh, or I'm going to cut off some of my some of my uh, drawing because I don't have enough paper <laughs> but Come in around here and this starts to taper off right around here somewhere. Then we have this darker line. Or I mean the darker painted area. Coming in here. And so on. Okay. So we have a little bit of a reflection in there, and I've drawn that a little bit lighter. Alright, let's get into the painting now. So when I'm painting something or I'm trying to work out um, a workshop or something like that and, and I haven't painted it yet and I have to tell somebody what colors to use. Well, what I'll do is I'll take a little uh, swatch of watercolor paper. I save all these little bits. They're very useful. Even the backs of old paintings are fine for just testing out the colors. And I'm going to see if whatever colors I have on here are a good match for what I need. I'll even work out some of my color mixes uh, because I have to tell people what colors to bring to the workshop. So unless I actually go and paint the whole thing first, uh, which is a whole, another whole day or two days or whatever, um, then I have, I have to figure out what these colors are going to be. So I'm going to take a cobalt blue here and it looks like it might be like too dark and, and which is fine but if I work it that way I can get a, um, a good match to my color and I, I will usually paint it right at the edge of the paper so rather than you know putting a blob in the middle of the paper here, I will put it right at the edge because then I can just hold it right beside it. Now it does look a little bit darker than the neck, but it looks pretty darn close to that head. So that is a cobalt blue and I know that in this project I'm going to use cobalt blue. Alright, so that's a cobalt and um, next I'm going to try to figure out what this yellow is going to be. So this yellow, it looks to me as though it might be a gamboge. Now gamboge, this is a Da Vinci watercolor, it's a mixture. This one, this is a, not a pure gamboge, it's a mixture. And if I try this color, ooh, it's not quite a good match, right? It needs something else. So I can either keep searching for the perfect yellow on my palette, or I could work out a mix that would be the right color. So if I had just a basic palette, let's say my basic palette was cobalt blue, gamboge, permanent rose. Let's, let's just say, for example, that's my mix. And that's the only three colors I own. 
Um, so I have to figure it out. I have to figure out what am I going to need to do to this yellow to make it into a, a nice sort of golden yellow like that. So I'm going to take some of my permanent rose. Let's grab some of this here. And see if I can recreate that yellow into something more accurate. And I think that's a pretty good match. Now, if I add a little more of the permanent rose here, for example, or here, a little bit of each, and I, I make that color a little darker, then I have something very close to this coloring right in here. So the reason I'm actually talking about this is because I know many of you take workshops. I mean, I, I still take workshops. Why not, right? I like to see how different artists approach things. And I like to see what they do. And almost every single workshop that I've ever attended has supplied a, a list of materials. Now, do you have to run out and buy every every item on that material list? In most cases, no. Of course, a material list has to be provided to give you an idea, but let's face it, you probably have something you can use already. So why would you go out and buy a whole bunch of new stuff? How many of you, <laughs> you can let me know in the chat, how many of you actually have um, bought everything on the list only to find out that you didn't use it all or you didn't need it all? Um, you know, you could have used something else and oh, like I've done it. I, I've totally done it. <laughs> but um, the, uh, the, the thing is that you really don't need to have every single thing on the list when you clearly have something that you can substitute. So if you only brought a couple of colors to your class, you can work around it. And honestly, you don't even need to... Um, to be a perfect match. You just need to be in the right sort of color temperature. You need to be in the right value and things like that. Uh, the printer, the printer that I'm using. Okay, the, a lot of people ask me that. Uh, this, is a, this is a brother printer and it is a, oh, it's a huge machine that I have. It's because I, I print out uh, things that are 11 by 17, so it takes larger paper. Uh, but it's a uh, brother, uh, maybe I can find that information later and add it to the description underneath the video if you want to know that one. Um, yeah, so it, the thing I like about it, it's got the, the ink, um, what do you call it, the ink saver thing where it's like got a huge uh, reservoir instead of individual cartridges all the time. So, um, so I like that. Um, okay, so now we need to figure out what what are these darks now there's there's Payne's gray let me make a make a note of this but this was um um gamboge so we'll go gamboge and permanent rose, rose. <laughs> I'm just learning to spell here, apparently. Um, so, you know, this is what I do is I will I'll sit and I will iron out all of my colors. And then when I go to paint, it is so much more stress free when I don't have to think about all the colors. So I will often do this, uh, whether I'm teaching it or if I'm just painting it on my own, I'll, I get my colors worked out right from the beginning. I don't know that I've really talked about that so much in my previous work, uh, previous demos or anything like that, but I think it's an, kind of an important thing. So I've got kind of two options that are good on my palette here. I've got Payne's Gray and I've got Neutral Tint. So, hmm. Uh, I know um, about... Payne's Gray. Payne's Gray, let me show you the difference here. Also, I'll show it, show it over here. So Payne's Gray is a very strong dark. 
right? That's that's Payne's gray. It's it's a little bit bluish. Now let me zoom in on this. Just, I just want to zoom on this little piece here so that you can see um, what the difference is between Payne's gray. Because I get this question quite a lot, actually. The, so the Payne's gray. If I thin it out a little bit here, you'll see sort of the sort of bluish greenish undertones. Let me try and get that in focus a little better. There. If I zoom in more, will it work? There we go. Okay. So, um, so it's a little sort of bluish green. It's also really dark, really kind of opaque almost. Um, but I'm going to try the neutral tint now. And when you see them side by side, you'll see what the difference is. So you can see that as I put the neutral tint down, it is a little bit more warm. It's, it's a little bit on the purple side. When you see them side by side, you can really tell what the difference is. And I'd have to use a lot more pigment to get it as dark as that, but I can do. So if I use like lots of pigment, I can get that quite dark as well. So a lot of people don't really realize the difference between the two, but um, but that's what I see, is I see a, a real color t temperature difference here. We've got the, the um, cool, bluish, greenish kind of colors, and then we've got the warmer purple, uh, pinky purple kind of um, undertones for the neutral tint. So which one's better? Well, I think in the blue areas, the Payne's Gray would probably be good, but I think either one would really be good for the darks because in this case I'm mostly using it as a dark but what I would do because of these really warm tones right here I think putting in a neutral tint this this color here would actually be a little nicer than using this you can see that this doesn't look that compatible with with the uh, the warm tones we're trying to gonna try and get there so if I had to pick one, the one I'm going to pick is neutral tint. So, because I do have the flexibility in both cases to make it either light or dark, but I think that the um, the warmth of it will be better with my warm tones. So we'll go neutral tint. All right, so we have a palette of four colors. Cobalt, Gamboge, Permanent Rose, Neutral Tint. So basically primary colors plus neutral tint for my dark. And that's often how I will work out my, um, my process of figuring out what colors I'm going to be using in any given project. So if I need to make my cobalt dark, I can use more pigment. And if I make, need to make it duller as well, then I can add some of my neutral tint. All right, so let's start off with the painting. Let's zoom out again. By the way, if you have a question, um, try and put it in capitals because I can spot it a lot easier. Um, I'm, I'm kind of multitasking when I do these demos, so I'm kind of running the, the video equipment and I'm painting and I'm talking and <laughs> reading all at the same time and I'm not really good at that, but uh, if you put it in capitals, it'll be a lot easier for me to see. Um, where did I purchase my palette? Oh gosh, I got that a long time ago. This is a Speedball palette. It is on the... Um, it is listed on my list of materials on my website. So my website's here. There's a page called materials and you can see a lot of the materials that I typically use. And you can also find a scroll down to the bottom of that page and you'll find a bunch of, um, uh, sources as well. So some of the sources, and if you know of any good sources, let me know. I will try and add that to my list. All right, so I'm going to be using a nice round brush here. This one's a number 10 uh, Baya Elk uh, squirrel hair brush. That's what I've got in my hand here. It's a travel brush, um, and again, it's listed, it's listed on my website. And I'm going to start off with my, um, with my uh, blues, I think. So just get rid of some of these other lines. I've, if I don't paint over the lines, 
I have the potential of being able to um, being able to uh, uh, erase it afterwards. So I'm going to try to come and not really go right up to the line, but we'll see. So cobalt blue. How dark to make it? Hmm. Well, I'm going to err on the side of caution and I'm going to go lightly at first. So that looks pretty good. But I have to remember one thing. This is going to dry a lot lighter. So let's come in here and paint the head. Now while this is wet, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in and add the shadow. So I'm going to take more blue from, from my well here, not this puddle here, but a little bit drier color. And I want to come in and put an extra dark right along the bottom here. Now as I put this in, and, and one thing I will say about all of my colors that I've chosen to use is that um, most of my colors, and this is really important for glass, is that my colors are transparent colors rather than um, rather than uh, uh, opaque colors, right? I, I don't want to color cover up the white of the paper. Uh, neutral tint, opaque, no. I I have not found that it is an opaque color. Uh, now, it does vary from one brand to another. So the one that I'm using here, this one is uh, Winsor Newton. So this one is a um, Winsor Newton and, uh, you know, you saw the, the sort of purplish color that it has. But I find that it is very transparent, actually. So then we have the next portion here which is really dark but I can't do it yet because if I did it right now then all this dark color oops all that dark color would bleed right into my face so I'm going to go to another area that's really light so I'm going to thin down my blue again and I'm going to come into this neck area here so always looking you know where's the lightest area and then I add the dark I might as well come over where the dark is because I can add the dark on top. But one thing that I cannot do is add the yellow on top. So I cannot paint the entire neck uh, blue because if I put yellow on top, well, you know what's going to happen. I'll end up with a green neck. So I do have to keep those colors separate. However, this dark area, let's, let me zoom out a little bit here so I don't have to keep sliding this back and forth. This, this dark area here, I can paint that over top. And this is going to get a lot darker down at the bottom. So I'm going to come in with a little more pigment, get my puddle a little darker for this segment down here. Because I know that that has to be darker right down in here. And if this is just as wet as, as what's in the neck, they should blend together, but it did dry a little bit, so I'm going to just come in here and help it blend. So take a little more pigment, come in a little bit more with this blue color. Don't need to worry about the darks. The darks can always be added in. Put that in there and I'm feeling like this has this has bled more than I want and it's fresh paint so I'm going to come in with my clean water here I'm going to lighten this up see it's fresh paint I can move it pretty easily without any problem um, if I were to leave that for a week and then say Oh, you know, I think that's a little bit too dark. I want to come back to that. It might be too late. Um, you know, that that color will be really set into the paper. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I'm just reading some questions. Neutral tint is not opaque. Um, yeah, and a couple of you've said <laughs> that uh, you have a lot of paints. Yeah, you, just to show you, uh, that I have a few paints. I have a whole big tub of many colors in here. Uh, this isn't even all of them, but uh, you know, I have quite a few colors. <laughs> and many of those I have purchased for classes that I've gone to. Um, so I'm going to let that dry up a little bit and then I'm going to come in again with my dark. I, I really don't want that to bleed in there so much. So I, I've lifted that out, got back to the transparency of the color and I'm looking to see is that the right, is that as light as it needs to be or as dark as it needs to be? And now that I've lifted that out, it feels more correct. If, if in doubt, you can always take your little squares that I'm always talking about. You know, you can take a little square here and put one on, put one on the painted area, put one on the, the uh, reference picture and see whether or not they match. So that's one way to check the values. Um, I use it more for checking the value than the actual color. Uh, but okay, so I'm not going to worry too much about the little nuances. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to basically get rid of the white of the paper at this stage because the white of the paper is so deceiving. It can throw off your perception of the correct value so easily. So I'm just going to come in with um, a little bit of pale blue in here, just a um, little bit on my brush. Then I'm going to take some darker blue and this over a little bit. I'm casting a shadow with my microphone here. So I'll move that over a little bit. So I'm going to come in and go much darker in this section right here. This little segment of the neck is picking up a lot more color. All right, so I'm going I'm going to dry this just so that I can keep moving here. That looks like it might be a little bit dark, but it's it is going to dry lighter, so I'm just going to I'm going to stick with it. There we go. So I'm just going to give this a really quick dry so that I can move on to my um onto my yellows. When you paint glass, one of the things you can think of is not that you're painting glass, that you should be thinking, what is that shape? What is the value? How light or dark is it? You know, um, Don't worry so much about the overwhelming task at hand. Just work one little segment at a time. Just break it down into little digestible bits. All right, that's plenty to dry that. I have no masking on here, so um, so I can I can use my heat gun, and that dries that very quickly. Um, there's probably other little bits that I have to add in here. I certainly have to add some into the shadows. I'm going to do the reflection last, by the way. Uh, so I'm going to paint the 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 glass first, and then I will paint the um, the uh, reflection. There's not a lot of white on this. Very often when you paint glass, there's lots of little white sparkles and things like that. Um, this is a white area right up in here. Uh, there's a couple of little whites in here. And if, if there's so few like that, um, I can either do some of them, you know, if I want a soft highlight, like, like some of these are pretty soft, I could do those by lifting out. And I'll show you that um, after, after it's painted. But I can also use a little bit of masking. If I want hard edges, I will use masking. And if I want soft edges, I will try to lift out 
depending on your paint, whether it's a staining color, you can lift out pretty easy. And I know that cobalt does lift out quite easily. So I'm going to take a little bit more of this darker blue, come up along the top here. I see a little bit along that upper, upper neck there. And there seems to be a little bit in this um, dark area here too. So I'm going to come into this area with dark, even though um, it's not blue. I will be putting some other color on top of this, but I'm going to put this blue for now because I can paint the, the dark on top. And then when the dark is on top, I can leave little areas where the, the blue shows through. So it's all about the planning in watercolor. You know, you have to think things through and think ahead to the process and you can't just come in and say, hmm, what do I do next? You have to have it all sort of figured out in your head. So you need to develop a, uh, a, a way of thinking ahead and planning a lot better in watercolor than maybe some other medium. If I were working in acrylic, for example, and I wanted to add that blue in, well, I'd just pick up some blue and add it on. Piece of cake. But um, in watercolor, you have to plan for these things. So. so that's really dark in there. I'm going to come down and get some dark on this uh, side of the neck as well. Now this this area right here, um, it, there's a, a clear distinction between the light blue and this really dark area here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in with my blue, which ends up being really soft at the bottom. So I'm just going to rinse my brush and blot it and soften this lower edge here. My brush is blotted, so it's not moving the paint around very much, just enough to soften that lower edge. And then the top part of that starts to get darker, so I'm going to take some of that neutral tint. This is where I'm coming in with some of my neutral tint, and I can get this nice and dark right here. Now there's no absolute right or wrong order in which to do these things, but since the blue kind of trans transitions into this dark, I'm just doing this one at the moment. Normally I would leave all these darks till the end, but it, I find it very helpful actually to put a dark in early on in my painting because that's um, a good gauge for me to determine whether or not other areas are dark enough or light enough. Um, and to get that extra dark in there early is uh, as actually pretty beneficial. So I have most of my blues in here. Um, as I said, I can come in and touch up a few things afterwards, um, you know, add a few things in and that type of thing. But uh, most, for the most part, I think I'm nearly done with the, the blues here. There's a little triangle up in there. Maybe a little bit underneath the beak. And that would be about, about all I need to do with that blue. Okay, so the blue I have out of the way. Well, at least the blue for the swan, not for the reflection. But um, now I'm going to go to my yellow. Now, I want to make sure I've got a clean spot on my palette. So, because I, I want my colors to be sort of fresh and vibrant, especially the early stages of my painting. If my colors aren't fresh and vibrant at the start of my painting, I can't get them back afterwards. You know, it has to happen at the beginning of your painting. So make sure you've got clean brushes, clean palette, clean water, all of that stuff. I do have two water containers. I have a clean one and um, a um, muddy one. So I'll rinse out in the muddy one. And then if I need to pick up new water, I pick up from the clean. So I'm going into my gamboge here. And as I said, this is a gamboge mixture by Da Vinci. It's nice and bright, very vibrant. I actually find it a little brighter than the genuine um, gamboge. So with that, I'm going to mix a little bit of my permanent rows, put them side by side because I can just sort of bring in enough 
just enough of the red. The red's a lot more powerful than the yellow, so you don't need very much of it. I want to bring just enough in to warm that up. And you know what? Once I do that, it's almost like a quinacridone gold, right? One of my, one of my uh, favorite colors, actually, quinacridone gold. I need, I need to make a bigger puddle here, so I'm just bringing, a, bringing in a little bit more because I'm looking at my reference picture here, and I'm, or my drawing here, and I'm thinking I'm going to need a lot more of that color. All right, so it looks like I have probably about the right yellow, but I need to make sure that it's transparent enough. That's the thing. The white of the paper has to come through that um, color. Or, yeah, the color that I put down, the white of the paper has to come through. That's what makes it look transparent. I know that seems weird, and, and, and I actually have one or two students who insist that they need to add white to their... <laughs> To their paint but no 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 um, just thin down the paint the white of the paper will do the work of creating that transparency so I can go right over the dark areas and everything because I know that I can um, paint dark over light very easily so let's just jump right in I'm going to I think I need a little more little bit more of the permanent rose into that to get the right value. It's getting better. I had the mixture worked out but I you know I still have to look and match. Now there's going to be some light areas in there which I might be able to lift out but um, another option would be to use uh, white paint just for a couple of accents in the end uh, not to mix with my yellow or anything like that just little white accents can be added in the end if that's the way you want to work instead of pulling out masking fluid or anything like that or lifting it's always options it's up to you which which one you decide to use um, okay so we're going to come into the body of the swan here. It's pretty light. I'm going to dilute this a little bit more up up here in the tail area because it's pretty pretty light right in that little section there. So I'm going to make sure I thin down my color and then it gets a lot stronger as it comes forward. Definitely a lot stronger in this this foreground area but I'm just going to cover the white of the paper for the time being. Get my paper wet. Nice transparent colors that I'm using to start with. Quinacridone gold would probably have been um, an equally nice option here. You know, if your if your instructor said, "Oh, you've got to have quinac or quin gold," and and you go to your store, you know how frustrating it is these days. Stores don't carry everything that you want, and you go there and. Uh, they don't have what in stock what you need and it can be a real frustration so it's good to um, sort of play around with the colors you have and see if you can match it if you want to know what color you're matching to because and let's face it you don't have it uh, you don't have the color that's on the list so you might have to go to the manufacturer's website um, just make sure that your um, your screen that you're looking at on your um, computer is fairly accurate color. I know some screens, you know, if they're really sort of not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, you know, when they haven't balanced out the colors and things like that, they will end up um, giving you false readings of what the colors are. But for the most part, when you have colors on your screen, it's... Um, they're usually pretty vibrant and you can get a pretty good indication of what things should look like. So you can match to that if you don't have the actual color. I actually have a, a painting friend who will, um, she, she brings these little cards, like cards like this, 
to all her classes, you know, classes where, or get gatherings, uh, you know, when she gets together with other painters. And if a painter has a color that she doesn't have, she doesn't ask to borrow the color, but she asks for a sample of it. She paints it on here and she marks down what it is and what the pigments are. And I thought that that was the most clever idea because then she has a record, a, a first-hand record of what the colors are. So I'm coming in with some uh, deeper color here. Now, I, I have to remember that as I'm coming in with deeper color, that my brush can't be as watery as it was. If it's w as watery as it was, I'm going to get blossoms. And the, I'm not looking for blossoms, thank you very much. I really would like to have some uh, smooth washes here. This is glass. We don't want to have any nastiness going on. So uh, I want to keep this fairly um, smooth. So I can work in here for this amount of time. All right. When you work this amount of time, you've missed the boat because the, the paint and the paper are starting to dry and uh, now you're going to start getting harder edges and things like that. And I'm feeling like if I keep working into this before it um, before it's fully dry, like when it's sort of semi-dry, I'm asking for trouble. So I'm going to dry this. Drying it um, kind of sets the color, you know, keeps it from moving around, helps it to absorb into the paper, and then it stays there, right? It's, it's the staying there that's the important part. Now this is um, a little warm. I don't want to paint on warm paper, but I didn't dry up in here, so I'm going to work and fill in that little area while this is while this is cooling down. You can usually find some place to work in your painting while something else is drying. And it's a good kind of habit to get into so that you don't end up playing when you shouldn't play. So I'm looking for all those little, little yellow bits. A bit of yellow in there I could have put in, but it's blue now, so I can't do that. Um, all right, so that's cooled off enough. I'm going to come in with deeper yellow, so not as much water in my brush. Maybe a little, even a little more red to help make it darker. I'm even going to sort of blot my brush so it's not really gonna go on really wet. And I had said that this line here was going to be my highlight area. So I'm gonna go under that. And you'll notice that I've, I've not used gray or anything like that to darken my yellows. This was something that I actually I actually did. I hate to admit it, but I actually did this when I was learning to paint and that I would come in and try to darken a yellow with something like a gray. Well, you, that doesn't work. <laughs> I can tell you right now that doesn't work. It, you end up with kind of a very er ugly color. So um, darken it with more pigment and usually yellow as, I'm not going to say always because sometimes there's exceptions to every rule, um, but often you're going to get a darker yellow by adding um, a bit of red to it. That's more often than not what I find is the case. So either warm it up, uh, but uh, some, some yellows can get actually a little bit green. So you know, if I was doing a lemon and it was on a uh, 
blue tablecloth, well, of course, it's going to have green shadows, not red shadows. So um, coming in with that, making that brighter, and it probably looks like like much brighter than this, right? But I haven't put the darks on top yet. So I'm going to do these uh, separately. Now I need to leave that little gap in between, so I'm going to come in and paint and just leave that little gap. And this comes right up to this little area. So it's, you see the gap I'm leaving. Let's come around here and get this shape in here too. The one thing that's really nice about painting glass is not every case, but many cases, you're going to have just a shape you can paint in. You don't have to put it on wet paper or anything like that. You know, it's very often a matter of um, hard edges in glass. So going to come up here and I'm not stopping where the dark area is I'm just painting it right to the edge because then then everything will be seamless right I won't have these weird I won't have to match the yellow up to the dark I just put the dark on top it's so much easier um, okay so we've got some of these shapes in here now that we have to put in and again I've got this this little highlight area and I'm going to leave a gap like I did here. So I'm looking at this little shape and I'm coming in. And then there's a gap so I will do the next shape up and I'm painting that gap. So it's all about the planning, right? You've got to think ahead. Now there's a couple little highlights in there that are kind of bluish. I might have to come in. I don't want it to turn green, so I'm going to mix a little bit of my blue with my white later and add that in there. But um, okay, then we have this funny teardrop shape in the middle. So I'm going to paint that with a little bit of a hole in the middle. I feel like it could be a little bit um, longer, so I'm going to lift some of that out. And you can see I can lift that out pretty easy. All right. It's coming along pretty quickly. So I'm going to next think about adding some of my darks because once the darks start going in, then it starts to come together. You might look at it at this stage and say, well, hmm, I don't know, it's kind of, it's, it's okay, it's nothing great. But you put those darks in, you save those, um, save those darks till, till the end. It's like a, the reward for sitting through all of the, the washes and things like that. So nice. Um, I'm just sort of checking the the comments here. Uh, yeah, quite a few of you will buy all the colors. Been there, done that. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to come in now with my neutral tint. Now, if I wanted my neutral tint to look cooler, I can mix blue with it. So if I take some of my blue here and I put neutral tint into that, I can make a cool color out of it. So in my areas of blue, I can come in, make sure things are dry up here, I can come in and paint, and I'm using a smaller brush now. This is just a synthetic brush, it's a number six. and. And I'm going to paint in some of these darks. Now I like to leave the darks for last because if I'm trying to paint a light color up against a dark color, well, 
I could very easily reactivate that dark color and then I'm in trouble because it will bleed into my light color. I'm probably not telling you anything you don't already know. No, I'm sure you've all discovered <laughs> some of these things all on your own. But um, this line here, it's very sort of irregular. It's it goes thick, it goes thin. It's not a straight line or anything like that. And then there's a secondary line right in here, which is. Um, it's actually more of a gold tone, so I'm not, I'm not going to paint that with the neutral tint. I'm just looking for these these dark areas here, and to see what I can find in the darks. And this is where I have this area at the top. Now I'm going to zoom in. Um, you've got you've got this image here, so you really don't need to see my printout, but I'm going to zoom in. So you can see, because I'm working more on detail, so I should zoom in. All right, so I'm going to come into this and and where I said that there's some little speckles of white or little bits of blue in there, I'm just going to skip over and leave a few little bits of blue. So I'm sort of scribbling with my with my dark here, my uh, neutral tint and just leaving a few little spaces where there's some blue in there. It doesn't have to match the photo. Not really, it doesn't have to be photorealistic or anything like that, but I just need to leave a little hints of blue in there. And I'm putting this right over top of the blue. So it's got a nice uh, sort of cool tint to it anyway, because I've got the blue underpainting. Contrast is what the name of the game is with uh, with glass. You're going to get lots of contrast. Go into this one here. So, I'm just going to dry that because I don't. It, see, it feels a little damp there, and I don't want it to bleed. So I'm going to just dry this down here. I don't want to put my hand on it. Okay, so while that cools down, I'm going to come up to the beak area and I'm going to look for things like little little bits of shading um, on the on the beak here. There's little bits of the neutral tint. That's, sorry, that's not really in focus, but uh, you get the idea where I'm where I'm looking and. I'm using it a little bit thinner here because this is kind of a delicate section of the swan. It's not doing a solid line here, just um, breaking it up every once in a while. Little gaps. And I'm going to use a mix of cobalt blue, a little bit of the neutral tint. Now it's more cobalt blue here because I want to get some, some darks in here. And I'm going to come along and do this shading on the face. Okay, so it comes along here, something like this. That high contrast, that's such a typical thing in watercolor, or in uh, glass, I should say. Um, so there's some of these, that's a little too much, blot my brush. Um, there's some of these sort of little squiggly things going on in this little section. Uh, I'm not going to make them precise. I can get the general idea just by sort of squiggling in a little bit of that, and I can get that same effect. 
Um, is that in focus? I'm gonna, I'm gonna zoom out a little bit just to make sure it's in focus. All right, so uh, oh, the greetings are still coming in. My goodness, you guys are are awesome coming from all over the place. Um, so let's let's come down here now to this uh, front of the the chest area of the swan. This is nice and dark, so I'm, I'm using a fairly um, rich mix of the neutral tint. Little bit of cobalt blue in it. And this is where having a brush with a really nice point is going to come in handy. I can kind of lay the brush down on its side to fill in a large area. And then when I need to sort of taper it off into a, into a smaller section, um, I can get right up on the tiptoe of this brush and uh, create that. Now there's a little sort of teardrop shape in here I'm looking at. You notice I'm, I'm talking a lot about the shape, you know, that you know, when it comes to a point or when it's uh, filled in and things like that. It's, it's just the shape I'm looking for. I'm not really thinking, well, does this look like a swan or anything like that? I'm just making sure that I'm painting the shape and the value that I see. Hopefully in the right color, but even if it's the wrong color, it's usually pretty forgiving. The value is going to make a lot more difference than the color will. Although I think color temperature is pretty important too. Um, this is a nice fine line, so I'm kind of holding my breath, holding my my brush so that the the point of the brush is hitting the the paper, and then I just I'm going to move my whole arm here for this for this line. So not with my wrist, but with my arm. All right, I can get a smoother line by sliding my arm than I can by um, using my wrist. So even, you know, if I came back over it to darken it or something like that, it's my arm I'm moving. And if you're somebody that has a shaky hand, um, you might find that very helpful, just to move your whole arm instead of just your hand. Okay, so now it, I want to move on to some of the darks that are on the yellow part of this swan. And um, I, I do know that some of these yellows really aren't dark enough yet. Um, I'm going to adjust those as we go along, like after I put on some of the darks. I want some of the darks on there in order to help me to um, um, estimate what the right value should be. So I'm going to come in, but this time I'm not going to have cobalt blue mixed into my neutral tint. I'm just going to use neutral tint, which is a nice warm color to start with. And I'm going to come in and just basically paint these uh, these areas. So uh, coming in and by the way if you're not really sure what I mean by warm colors and cool colors um, on my palette the top half of my palette is cool colors the bottom half of my palette is warm colors. Uh, so you see that all the warm colors are in the, the yellow, orange, red family, and the cool colors are in the blues, greens, um, and things like that. I see a lot of people talking about 
um, you know, color and things like that, but not really referencing how warm or cool a color is. And I, I think it's pretty important, especially in creating um, a glow in your watercolor. Recently finished one. You can see it on my Instagram. It's a, a rose and it was illuminated by the light. So you've got the sort of transparent petals of a rose and the the um, sun is hitting it. So you get this nice warm yellow coming through these blush colored petals. And uh, what a difference it can make to really uh, pay attention to those color temperatures. <laughs> Thanks, David. I held my breath, too, when I was doing that. You know, I noticed that as I'm taking pictures, I hold my breath as well. Mostly to hold my camera still, I think. But I was noticing that as I was taking some progress pictures, and I, I'm trying to line it up in my camera, and I'm holding my breath. And I would, took, took a, a bit of time to line it up and realized that I was <laughs> holding my breath. So try not to hold your breath too long. <laughs> Remember to breathe. Right, pick up more in my brush here. Now when you're doing little things like a little point or something like that, sure, don't have too much in your brush, but when you've got a big area to fill, load up that brush. I've got a I've got a larger area to fill here and I know that there's a little white highlight on there. I'm going to um, I'm going to use white paint I think on some of this. Now here's the thing, I've been mostly using solid color here, but what I want to do is also start varying it. So I need to thin this a little bit so that some of that yellow glow comes through the color. So here when I put it on thick, it is it does appear to be fairly opaque, but I can thin this down and it actually has quite a bit of transparency. So I'm going to come along here and you can you'll see the yellow coming through this color so knowing how um, sort of thickly or how diluted to make your color that's kind of a big deal in watercolor because it that really tells whether or not something is a solid object or a transparent object, and it allows colors to flow through. Uh, that's why they have societies that are just transparent watercolor only. They're, they're kind of watercolor purists, I guess, where you've got, um, you know, just you, through the use of transparent color and letting things glow through um, to get the effect that you're looking for. So this is fairly diluted neutral tint that I'm putting down here, but I'm going to come in with some dark as well, like a little bit stronger color, so that I get uh, a variation along here. You see it went very dark, now thin, and then back to uh, trans, like uh, back to some dark again. Catch any of those blossoms. If you see a blossom happening as you're working, blot your brush, run your brush through it. That usually will take care of it. Um, okay, so I actually see a little bit of a little bit of red peeking through that. So I'm going to mix a little red into my neutral tint. That permanent rose. Remember, I was using a very limited palette here. I'm going to use a little red through there. So I'm, I say these things and you might be looking at this and going, how does she see those colors? 
I get that a lot. Well, how does she see those colors? Um, I hunt for them. I look for them. Where is their color? Where can I add color? You know, if, if it doesn't seem obvious where a color is, um, you know, like it, it's like people who look at clouds and you say, what color is a cloud? Well, it's white. It's actually a lot of colors. So I know you've all heard of, or seen that scenario before. Clouds have lots of colors. And it's not until somebody points out that there's lots of colors in there that you really take notice of it. And I think as an artist, uh, you can really start taking notice of where there's colors. And sometimes they're very subtle. There's a game I play once in a while. It's it's a it's a free download. It's called I Love Hue, and uh, basically it's a it's a whole gradation, um, you know, a different bright color in each corner, and then it uh, you have to it, it shuffles it all up. It's like little squares, and it shuffles it all up, and you have to put it back together. And there's so many subtle little variations in that. It, it's kind of a not a bad way to train your brain to view. Uh, slight um, uh, slight transitions between uh, color intensity and and shift in color and things like that um, great thing to do if you know if you're sitting waiting for a bus or something like that um, it's uh, it's just something that works out pretty well for uh, training your brain to see those things so now I've got some of my darks in there. It's feeling pretty good, looking looking pretty decent, but I do need to get in a little bit more um, more going on in, in these areas. They, they look very unfinished right now. I have only two values. I've got a light value and a dark a medium value, but I need to start shifting things a little bit more. So I want to look at some of this gray down yellow all right some of this gray grayish yellow so that's going to be my yellow here fairly intense color so not a lot of water in here but i'm going to have some of course you have to have some so i'm going to get my nice uh, deep yellow that i've mixed and i'm going to put a little neutral tint into that and you can see that what i get is this really kind of warm uh, almost a brownish color brownish gray kind of color and I want to start coming in to create some of those um, darker areas but you see how much warmer they look than than say this this neutral tint by itself here And I'm just looking at shapes. Shapes and whether or not that color matches what I'm doing. Like where that area is. So I'm looking to see. That's a darker color there. Goes through there. I've got some of this color on the neck. So let's thin some of that down. I'm still not using really um, thick color here. I'm still... Even though I'm using a dull color, I'm trying to use it as transparently as possible to allow some of that white paper to come through and keep my painting fresh looking. I'm just looking for all these weird little shapes for this color. If the if it looks like it has a soft edge, like that looks like it has a soft edge to me. So I'm going to rinse my brush and blot it and run that along that softened edge there or that edge to make it sure it gets a little bit soft right there. Let's 
come in here, start in here where it's darkest, come down and soften that in. So I'm going to rinse and blot my brush and just kind of walk that down. So I'm getting little more interesting shapes and things going on here. I'm going to come in along the just above that line where the where that highlight is. And the reason that I'm not really taking any uh, white paint or masking this because I want that nice and warm. I want that kind of yellow that highlight. So I want to make sure that I'm not um, just leaving the white of the paper. Do you know that the white of the paper is actually pretty cool? Uh, cool temperature, that is. <laughs> I mean, it is cool, but it's cool temperature. And I'm really trying to keep a little bit more warmth in here. So, looking here and maintaining that nice shape here. Let's soften this end. I'm going to soften this end right here. This just kind of starts fading up into that. And anywhere that I feel like I need to have a little more sort of strength of color in that yellow, I'm just using another layer to come in here, darken that up a little bit. I can even put this over top of my dark. And perhaps leave a little highlight in there too. Got just a little space in there. So that transition starts to get a lot softer because I've brought some of those warm tones down into the into that part of the swan. Okay, so the swan is starting to look pretty complete. I need some, to do something with this little gap here. That looks a little bit funny, doesn't it? So I'm going to come in with my blue into here, soften that edge there, and then from the bottom I'm going to take that warm tone, put that in the bottom. Let's, I'm not going to mix, I'm not going to stir them together, but I want a little transition there. There we go. All right. Uh, now I'm going to come in and uh, think about doing my, my reflection. So this reflection, um, I, I don't want to have hard lines on it. I want to have um, kind of this nice soft edge. I want it to look like a reflection. I don't want it to look like, you know, just it's sitting on a mirror or anything like that. I want it to look like a reflection. Um, well, I guess in, in some way this is a little bit of a shadow of something that's transparent so the colors transfer through. Um, but uh, I'm going to dampen, let's take a nice clean brush here, and I'm going to dampen this area. I want to come carefully along the underside of the bird because I don't want to run that, run that color the dirty color down, right? I want to make sure I keep that nice and uh, clean. Once again, I'm holding my breath. All right, so I've got a bit of dampness in there. I don't want to make it too wet, no puddles or anything like that. I just want it a little bit wet. So what I need to do is I need to look for the right shine on my paper. So 
if I pick this up, let's see how much shine. You can see it's got a little bit of a satin shine. Not glossy, it's just a satiny type of shine. So that tells me that my color's not going to like run or rush out of where I'm trying to put it. It's it rush away and, and, you know, expand beyond where my, where my pencil lines are. So I'm going to go into my yellow now. And again, I need some nice sort of fresh color here. So I'm going to mix up a little bit more. But I cannot have my brush too wet. I do want my color thinner, but I need to blot my brush. And the reason I need to blot this brush is for control. It's not to dry brush, but it's to control so that my brush isn't holding on to a lot of water. And it's going to be very important for me to stay within the, the confines of the shape that I'm looking for, because if I don't stay in those in that shape and it bleeds down into where the blue's going to be, I'm going to end up with yellow in my reflection. Which is one of the reasons I picked this particular subject. It's it's got this this blue and yellow, beautiful complementary colors. They work lovely together. However, if things go wrong, got something on my hand. I don't know, I must have something on my hand, but um, the uh, the colors, if they run together, it's going to give me green. So I need to blot my brush, and you see, I can actually stay within the shape, and it's not it's not running all over the place or anything like that. And now I can rinse my brush, pick up some clean blue. Yeah, I'd go. I'd say pretty much blue here, just straight blue. Once again, I need to blot my brush. Make sure that my brush isn't holding on to too much uh, moisture. So we gotta think about an awful lot of things. This is why planning in the beginning, having your colors worked out and things like that, just makes it um, so, um, so much easier to sit down and just paint. So I'm gonna come down into this. Now that's bleeding a little more than I want, so I need to blot my brush a little more. And I'm just going to tap that with my paper towel just to make sure that that doesn't uh, get out of control. I'm going to come in and these colors can be so nice side by side. And one thing you get in reflections is you're going to get this sort of flare. You can see this sort of flare where the light passes through the clear areas of the glass. And so I'm going to work around that. But I can feel my paper drying. So I'm going to have to really step it up. Or I could take a flat brush. Taking a flat brush, blotting it, and just dampening this area a little bit, but just prior to painting on it, will buy me a little bit more time. All right, so let's come down here. And I need to avoid painting that little flare. I'm going to leave a gap, leave a bigger gap than you think you're going to need because guess what? It's going to, it's a damp paper. It's going to close that gap and the paint's going to travel and it's going to get smaller and smaller. Now I'm going to have to come in with something a little darker here as well, but this will give me a good start to this um, reflection. There's something on my paper here that's just ignore that. And I'm getting, see that dry look I've got there? That's not going to work for me. So I'm going to blot, blot this flat brush and just dampen this area. I 
Now I can paint into that and it's giving me this nice softness that I wanted. So it's a little bit of a, it buys you a little bit of extra time as you're painting. I don't know about you, but I find it very frustrating when I'm trying to paint and the darn paper's starting to dry. And there's ways of working around that. I know some artists, you know, they wet the back of their paper and so on. You know, there's lots of sort of workarounds for that. Uh, but mostly it's being aware of how wet your paper is, how wet your brush is, things like that, because those are extremely important. That's... I'm just going to come in here and see if I can clean up this edge a little bit with my blotted brush. This is my flat brush here. I'm just coming along this edge. Hopefully you can see that. My big arm in the way. Um, so that's that's at the stage now. Like I really can't do too much with that because I know that it's still too wet. Or it's too wet and it's not wet enough. <laughs> so, time to dry. I know that blue's not dark enough. I have to keep coming in and building some of these things. have to dry that a little bit more. I can, I can feel dampness, right? I feel dampness. And if I'm feeling any dampness right here, it's not time for me to re-wet it because I could start moving things around. My paper is not even taped down, so it's just wrinkling a little bit, but uh, we'll just work around it for today. So I'm going to let that cool, but meanwhile, I'm going to come up here with my eraser. This is just a soft eraser. I actually prefer my kneaded eraser. Where's that? My kneaded eraser is this much softer um, eraser, easier on the paper. Um, and I can come in and start to erase some of these lines and make things look a little bit more finished, a little bit more polished here. Get rid of some of that. Clean up all of this. All right, so I'm going to come in, add a little bit more dark in here, and it's going to be pretty much just a, a another version of wet and paint. Um, I don't want to get it quite so wet, so I'm going to just use my flat brush here. My flat brush doesn't tend to hold as much. It's a synthetic. It doesn't hold as much, so I can dampen without getting it really soaking wet. edge here. I want to keep that a little bit sharper because it's closer to the swan so it stays stays a little bit sharper but I'm going to dampen all of this area. And see I've dried it well enough that you know even even this brushing is not moving things so those nice first layers they're staying put. Now that's a little bit shiny, I think. I can see some shine. You can see, you know, some of that really shiny. I, I won't have any control if I try and paint on that. So, um, just blot some of the water off. And then I'll come in and paint in my, my blue. 
So my blue, I need to make that a little darker. I'm going to add a little bit of neutral tint to it. I'm going to blot my brush so that I have the control. This one's actually a little bit smaller brush, so we'll see. See how much control I have. And, you know, you can make your best guess at how, how wet the brush needs to be and that sort of thing, but let's face it, you're going to eventually get it wrong at some point. So you may need to blot your brush, rinse and blot, and soften an edge as you go. Even though you've wet the paper, you might need to do some of this. So come in a little bit of neutral tint with the blue. Let's come in a little bit under here. It's actually got to come up a little bit, I think, to there. Now, because I blotted that and didn't get it that wet in the first place, I do need to soften some of these edges. So before I do the entire stroke, I'm going to rinse and blot and soften edges as I go. You could get into trouble if you just sort of try to try to finish what you're doing. And I know that feeling. It's like, oh, I just want to finish this line. That's all I want to do. But then you come back to the beginning and you can't soften it because it's already dried. Well, that's that's the way watercolor is. You're gonna have you're gonna have things that don't always go your way. But you can manage it, right? So I'm putting this on, and you can see I'm getting a hard line. Don't want a hard line. Let's push this up a little bit here. Um, I don't want a hard line there, so what I'm going to have to do is soften it as I go. It starts to disappear there. Blot my brush. I'm going to lay it down. Lay it, I'm laying the brush down on the flat on its, on, on its side here. And the point of the brush is touching that edge. And you see that little bit of motion there? I can soften that edge very nicely. And I'll do the same on the other side. Lay the brush down. You see I've changed direction of my brush, right? I lay it down. I think I could have blotted that brush a little better, but I think it's okay. And I get a nice, soft, um, soft transition there. Could I do better? Sure, I could do better. Get a little more color in here. I'm struggling to go over the lumpy paper, <laughs> the the buckles in the paper. Look, okay, I'm getting some hard lines. Don't want to do that. Let's rinse, blot, and uh, this is awkward, right? You have to come and bring your brush around to the other other side, but you do need to turn your arm or like turn your direction of your brush. It does make a difference when you're softening an edge. Don't lay the brush in the, in the wet paint. Lay it in the dry, dry area. That's the part you need to get damp. All right, so we have some, some softness there. Sure, I could take more time. I could do a lot more sort of fussing and um, fidgeting and things like that. You know, I could fine tune this and really, really make it uh, just the way I want it, but don't want to don't want to run the risk of uh, sort of spoiling the freshness here. I'm just going to get a little bit more of the blue in here because it's not quite dark enough. Blot my brush, rin rinse and blot and soften some of these edges. There. So we're we're starting to 
starting to build up some of those darks in there that need to be as you know a little bit darker and that sort of thing and I think I could even go in with some of my gold tones here dull them down with a little neutral tint and I could come underneath the swan here there's a little bit of darkening right in here rinse blot soften this edge too so if you're looking for the reference picture and you want to give this one a try you can um, go to my Facebook page. My Facebook page is the same as my YouTube channel, um, Shelley Pryor Fine Art, and uh, I post, when I post my weekly, um, or at least I've started doing this, when, when I post my weekly um, live demos, I'm posting the reference picture underneath. So I'm going to try and do that going forward, and uh, let's zoom out here and see how it's looking. So I, I'm thinking that the values are pretty good. Um, I'm getting kind of the effect that I'm looking for, maybe a little bit more uh, gold in here, that type of thing. And you can come in and do like just some of this glazing where you come in and put thin layers over top to, to darken or shift a color and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, I think we're we're pretty much at the finish line here. <clears throat> yeah, so I think that's pretty close and uh, sure, I could fuss and, and fiddle till the cows come home, but I won't do that. Put a little blue in here maybe, hardly any. Uh, but that's my glass swan. So hope you enjoyed that and um, I'll be uh, I'll be back next week with uh, another demonstration. Thank you so much for joining me and uh, you know what to do. Give the old uh, thumbs up underneath the video. I appreciate it in the chat, but if you put it under the video, then it actually counts. Um, so let's, uh, let's sign off and I hope you have a wonderful week. Happy glass painting and we will see you next time.